All right. Well, welcome everyone um, to this webinar brought to you by Astas, Clifford Chance, Pierre and Kim, and Morgan Sports Law. Yes, that's right. These are all law firms. I'm afraid we are lawyers, business lawyers even, but deep inside, we are first and foremost gamers. Well, I know I am. Um, so this is why we are very, very happy to have you all today for that interesting discussion at the crossroads of the law and esports. Uncheating Cheaters is the name of the game today. We are joined by wonderful panelists. Um, I think it, it is important to stress that esports in recent years have experienced a trajectory that is nothing short of spectacular, really. Uh, in the span of what, say 20 years, it has become a multi-billion dollar industry. This is just phenomenal thinking of it. Um, there are today almost as many esports as there are traditional sports, or almost. Um, we have esports or video games that reenact traditional sports like FIFA with soccer, but we also have more core strategy games Starcraft, card games like Magic the Gathering, uh, first player shooters like Counter-Strike, fight games like Tekken, Super Street Fighters, and, and so forth. I need to stop myself here, um, or else I could spend all day on that. Um, it is crazy to think that today you've got major tournaments of those esports with price pools that are sometimes several million US dollars. Uh, such as uh, the Dota 2 Singapore Majors Tournament that will take place over the weekend starting tomorrow. Uh, but as you know or may guess, the higher the financial stakes and the stronger the temptation there is to game the game, unfortunately, that is to cheat. Uh, there might be that notion that because these are video games uh, we're talking about, uh, and they are mostly played by uh, young adults, teenagers, sometimes children. Cheating is not that big of a deal. Well, this is obviously wrong. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, to do that, we have set up two panels. The first one is going to focus on match fixing. Uh, that is basically to decide in advance the outcome of a game. Uh, this practice has become, unfortunately, rampant in traditional sports as betting especially became more and more popular. Uh, it has now become an issue in esports as well for the same reasons. Um, and the second panel will focus on doping and e-doping. Doping, everybody knows more or less what this is about. You ingest substances that will uh, uh, dope enhance your performance during a competition. Um, E-doping is unique to esports by definition. You're not boosting uh, yourself, you're boosting the software you're using to play the game. Um, and this is the second panel that will focus on that specific topic. So without further ado, I would suggest that we move to our first panel. Uh, please rest assured, dear participants, that you will have opportunities to ask questions. What I would invite you to do is to either write the questions in the chat or at the end of each panel, raise your hand. We can take a few questions from the audience uh, before moving on to the next panel. The next panel will be uh, moderated by my colleague and friend, Leonid Matenko, um, who is an international arbitration associate at Peter and Kim in Geneva. As for me, Rudolf Ruffier, Senior Associate at Clifford Chance, I have the privilege and the honor to moderate our first panel dedicated, as I said, to match fixing in esports. So turning to the first panel, match fixing in esports, let me please introduce our speakers. You have already seen them uh, uh, for the past 15 minutes in our chat, uh, uh, talking with each other. Uh, First, we have uh, Oleksandr Kohanovsky, also known as Zero Gravity. Hi, Alex. Hi. Um, thanks for being with us today. Alex is the head of the Ukrainian Professional Esports Association, the UPEA. 
as the name suggests, um, this association gathers uh, esports players, professional esports players in Ukraine, and represent their interests both at a domestic and international level. Um, Alex is a professional esports player himself. He's a big name uh, in the esports world, uh, and he founded uh, Navi Natus Vincere, Born to Conquer. In Latin, it is to this day one of the most successful esports organizations. It federates some of the world's best teams in most major esports, really. Uh, Counter Strike, Geo, Dota 2, Fortnite, FIFA, and so forth. So thanks for being with us today. Uh, uh, thanks. thanks. Uh, second on my list is Ian Smith. Hi, Ian. Um, Ian is based in England. Uh, he used to be and still is a traditional sports lawyer, but in recent years, uh, he has focused his practice on esports. In fact, he founded uh, in 2016, along with other major names in the esports industry, uh, the Esports Integrity Coalition, which has now rebranded itself as the Esports Integrity Commission, ESIC, E S I C. Um, the mission that ESIC, ESIC has given itself is, I quote, take responsibility for investigating and prosecuting all forms of cheating in esports that include, but is not limited to, match fixing and doping, hence our two panels today. Um, thanks, Ian, for being with us uh, today. Looking forward to our discussions. Um, third, Stepan Shulga, also known as Don Stepan. Uh, Stepan, thanks for being here with us. Stepan is the head of the cybersports division at Paris Match. Paris Match. No, I don't uh, have any symptoms, and I took the second test yesterday, and I'm waiting for the result. Uh, Can you unmute, Christina? Please unmute yourself. Okay, perfect. Uh, could, no, could no the, questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All I can remember. Mute Christina, Christina, please mute your yourself. Your regular Thank working you. day with, with the conference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry, Stepan. I was I was explaining to our audience that you're the head of cyber sports at Paris Match. Paris Match is a long-standing international betting company and and website. Um, at the scale of esports, it has been around well forever. Uh, because it, it has been uh, uh, created in 1994, um, and uh, it is today one of the main uh, online betting websites, uh, which has a division dedicated to esports. Uh, this is rare enough to mention it. Um, so thanks for being with us today, Stepan. Fourth on You're our welcome. panel is uh, Markian Kluczowski, who is a partner at Astor's Law Firm in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, Mark Ian uh, has been consistently ranked among the top lawyers in the region, both in international arbitration, dispute resolution, but also sports law, uh, which is rare enough to be uh, emphasized. Uh, Mark Ian has long-standing experience of both um, uh, international business disputes and sports dispute, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing from you today, Mark Ian. Thank you. Um, Finally, on that panel, uh, with us today, Miki Ingles, hailing from Manila, Philippines. Uh, Miki Ingles is an accomplished lawyer at Ingles, Laurel, and Calderon, uh, and a professor, a, a law professor at the Ateneo de Manila University, which is basically the top university in the Philippines. Um, but before being a lawyer and topping the bar exam in 2012, uh, in the Philippines, Miki played at the highest level of soccer, uh, aka football, uh, for Europeans um, in the Philippines. Uh, so he's a sports professional on top of being a, a legal practitioner and recently has even become a novelist. Uh, uh, his novel, uh, Alinam, set in an alternate reality of Manila, was published last year. It's a wonderful novel, so I encourage everyone to have a peek. Uh, Thanks to our panelists uh, for being with us today. Again, it's a pleasure, it's an honor, uh, and I'm very excited to moderate uh, those discussions. Without further ado, uh, let's delve right into it. 
Uh, in terms of format, uh, so the audience uh, understand how that will play out, um, we will explore a few questions, a few issues in turn with panelists. Uh, the panelists though should feel free to ask questions, to intervene uh, uh, in between each uh, questions that we will be discussing. Uh, and again, I can only encourage the audience to ask questions at the end of the panel. Um, that panel is scheduled to last until about uh, 12 15 uh, 12 tw uh, sorry uh, 1 uh, 1 p.m uh, uh, 20 in um, in uh, Europe that is uh, about 8 p.m 20 in uh, Asia um, so uh, in about an hour from now we will move on to the next panel but before we do that don't worry you will have opportunities to ask questions um, but please let me start asking questions to our panelists I'm turning virtually to you, Alex. Um, you are, as I said, an accomplished esports player, a professional esports player. You're at the head of Navi. Um, so I'm quite curious to understand your perspective and your take on match fixing. Um, it could be that you have been faced with or even been a victim of that issue uh, in the competitions that you participated in with your, uh, with your teammates. So. My first question perhaps would be, uh, how does that work internally within teams and perhaps even within Navi? Uh, what can teams do to prevent match fixing? Um, are there any sort of ways or mechanism to track and trace uh, the player's conduct within the team? Um, and is there even an obligation or a duty for a team to report the conduct of a player that has been found out to have attempted or even managed to fix a game. Uh, so what's your, what's your take on this, uh, Alex? Yeah, I think that's a good question because literally uh, we can divide this scene onto different layers. Yeah, and we can say that Sanabe and other professional teams, it's like at a tier one professional teams. Within the tier one community, match fixing is not a big deal to be honest, because like, first of all, you're working with your players, you're educating them, and you're trying, try, trying to put the pressure on them, of course, in terms of like how they can achieve their high results. Yes, like the first one that's striving to win big prizes and the money are insane. You know, like this year international is like $40 million, Fortnite World Cup, they're like providing $100 million. So the match fixing is not a big deal because first of all, you're fighting for a big chunk of money. The second one, you are already in a well-established scene if you will match fix first, your teammates won't agree on it. Yes, yeah, so this is like absolutely insane to have a tier one team, five members, five players, uh, five members uh, of the team will agree to like to lose the match because uh, because they're bet betting against themselves. So this is like sounds not too realistic to be honest. This is like the second thing: the third thing, this heavy sanctions applying from game developers, game developers are putting like a lot of efforts to avoid match, match fixing and any kind of cheating within their titles, especially whenever they're organizing their events. So that's something that's uh, kind of, I would say uh, on a top notch uh, scene play, uh, from, stand, from players and team side perspective, it's not a big deal. Whenever we are coming down to tier two and tier three, scene, yeah, of course, that's a match fix in heaven. Um, I think that's like, first of all, we need to understand it's, it's also coming from a different region. So yeah, the match fixing taking place in majority in China and within the CIS. Those like two regions is uh, under, under heavy, uh, let's say, uh, fraud list within, within those matches. The prize money are much lower over there. There are no kind of professional team because like, I wouldn't say that tier two or tier three teams, they are unprofessional in many ways. Yes, yeah, so that they can assemble a team just playing one tournament and just like uh, fall apart. And that's happening regularly. So it's really hard to track. I think that I, I really see, I'm really glad to see Ian on this call because he can dive deeper into how uh, ISIC is preventing those things. And I think that the ESIC and uh, any kind of entity that's uh, taking care globally, maybe regionally or globally uh, on the issue, it's, it's a really good start. So first, first of all, I think to prevent or like to work with this like tier two or tier three teams, 
The first one, this is like uh, an awareness. Yeah, you need to spread an awareness about the matrixing that this is like the case and the, uh, in certain countries, this is a criminal offense. Literally, you can go to jail if you will be caught cheating uh, on, on this particular case. So the second one, which I truly believe will have much more kind of, um, let's say, much uh, much more harder effect, harder harder in, the, in terms of like it will be uh, much much better effect. Whenever you, you we can spread the word publicly, yep. So it's Ian you know, knows that it's really hard to catch on hand in all the cheater. Like, hey, you've been matrixing, you've been banning against yourself. It's like it's really hard to uh, to provide an evidence of that. Yeah, it wasn't like because you cannot identify the person. Uh, someone else was betting on them, so this is like it's really hard. But anyway, spreading the word that this case much better, much fixing and. Uh, put these players or a team in terms of like, hey guys, there is a possible match fixing on this team, including these players. And this will happen once again and again, then you can issue some sort of the yellow or red card yet to the player team to ban them from participating uh, on the different events. Uh, we are in the Ukrainian Professional Sports Association are trying to imply that. We're literally really shortly, we, we, we are like starting and step on sure guys over here. Stepan knows about our initiative to help with the match fixing. We are uh, kind of releasing an integrity guide, something like that. And we are releasing a blacklist whenever we can blacklist certain players and teams and ban them from uh, participating in our events. So literally, I think spreading awareness about match fixing, trying to work uh, in the public field so they know this if they will match fix other, they might uh, appear on the blacklist somewhere and they might lose their teammates. Nobody wants to play with them because they cannot participate in different events. I think this is like, um, this is like the or, or like current options that's, uh, that we can take. And uh, this is like something that we can develop further, going further down the road. Okay, thanks, Alex. Uh, perhaps a couple of follow-up questions on, on what you have just said. Um, so I, I understand that uh, the Ukrainian uh, uh, Professional Sports Association is actively working on those topics. Um, just to make sure, um, if if a team were to be aware that some of it, its members uh, uh, are in the process of, of trying to uh, negotiate the outcome of a game in advance, uh, would you say that such a team needs to report it, for instance, to, to you or to ESIC? Uh, uh, or it's only until when the matter has already happened that you can actually sanction those individuals. I think they need to report immediately, of course. Okay. Because like we have an uh, we have a report button on the website and are in the section literally. They can report. They can uh, to take the screenshots or provide any kind of evidence. We will just put it public immediately and literally those player who is negotiating or those team who agree to to match fix they will literally ban from all of the events. So this is like, for us, it's really important. Um, we are, our main uh, goal in, in terms of like integrity over here in the region to have a match fixing free zone within the, our tournaments, our championships. So we are a hundred percent sure that those matches are clean. There are no fraud and everything going down and smoothly. So this is like for us, the number one goal. So we'll try to pursue it uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, and, and perhaps just again for, for clarity, um, still under that hy hypothetical scenario, say um, I'm, I know that some of my team members uh, uh, are in the process of, of trying to fix a, a, a game, a match, and I report them to um, the, uh, your association, for instance. Uh, do I have reasons to fear that the entire team would be sanctioned or the sanctions uh, or the, the, the bans that you have mentioned, the blacklisting would only apply to players specifically as opposed to the entire team if the other members are not really responsible for it. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's all about is it, uh, who is responsible in this case. Of course, if we're talking about the one team member and he's trying to get, hey guys, let's trust lose this match and bet against ourselves and, and everything so we can identify that. And of course, the team won't be sanctioned. Yes, they will remove this member. The member will be in the blacklist for 12 months for participating in our events. And maybe we will negotiate with other tournament organizers, spread the world. We can cooperate with ISIC 
uh, and is you can also try to imply certain sanctions. So it's always, I think it's case to case basis. And uh, we need to always keep our, uh, keep, uh, our eyes on the, how this negotiation or how, uh, who actually started the match fixing topic. Yeah, how it was born the idea uh, to bet against their, our, uh, themselves. Yeah, so, and um, in this particular case, uh, I would say it's the best, like the best solution from our end is what we can see. We will just separate always teams and players and then we go one by one try to identify what's going on. And of course, we can, we, 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 I think it's much more, uh, much more powerful to imply sanctions on the, uh, on the team member than the whole team. Because it's like, it will be uh, much more reasonable in this particular case. Okay, well, thanks. That's, uh, I'm sure that's uh, comforting to uh, those, those people who might be worried that something might be going on and then have misgivings about whether they should report or not. They would fear sanction for themselves when they're not responsible. I think uh, th this was important to stress. Thanks, Alex. Um, well, I'm naturally now turning uh, to you, Jan. Uh, from the perspective of ESIC, as I have mentioned at the very beginning, um, it is one of your main missions to go uh, after those players uh, and sometimes teams, unfortunately, uh, that uh, dab into match fixing. Um, so uh, I think it would be helpful for us to really understand first and foremost, what's, what's really the mandate of ESIC in that respect? Um, and, and what is the reach of the organization uh, in, in the uh, worldwide esports uh, landscape? Uh, and how does it work in practice investigating teams first? What, what does it mean? Is there any code of conduct to sign? And then if the code of conduct is breached, then uh, there's an investigation. How, how does that work in, in practice at, at ESIC, Jan? Oh, how, how long have you got, Rudolf? Um, right, so, <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, yeah, in a nutshell. Um, yeah, so firstly, just to loop back on, on what Alex had to say, because there's only one point I'd want to pick up with him. Well, there's, there's two, but the one is that the publishers, broadly speaking, so the, in effect, the owners of the game have actually done practically nothing to address this problem. Um, you know, yes, they do apply very harsh sanctions when they find out about it, but how they find out about it is either through us or through some journalist. Um, they, they've done nothing proactive to find out who's match fixing or or, or cheating. They're completely reliant on outside parties until very recently when um, Riot signed a, a deal with Sport Radar to provide some sort of fraud um, detection. So let, let's get that right. The, the, the publishers um, cannot stand up with any dignity uh, and, and realism in the fight yet against match fixing, because historically they've just pretended it doesn't happen um, until people like me come along and tell them that it is. So but putting that to one side, um, Alex and I have, have been talking for quite some time about the idea of blacklists, and I'm sure that there's a bunch of lawyers sitting on this panel just sucking their breath in about the idea. So I won't, um, I, I, I won't pursue that because firstly, first and foremost, I'm not an expert in Ukrainian law, where that sort of thing would be extremely, maybe extremely effective. Because we would love to publish a blacklist, but of course I'm scared of being sued by every player and team on that blacklist until I can provide uh, evidence, you know, solid stand up beyond, uh, you know, on balance of probabilities evidence that they are in fact, in fact match fixing. So we, we don't go that far, um, although we do maintain amongst our betting operator members under a very firm information exchange uh, memorandum of understanding an effective blacklist in terms of what teams and individuals they are prepared to offer betting markets on, which I think is a, is a step down from what Alex is suggesting, but it definitely helps that if we know, but cannot necessarily prove in front of a disciplinary panel that a team or player are regularly match fixing, the next best thing we can do is make sure that betting operators don't offer markets on those players and teams so that they lose uh, the incentive and effectively get rid of their cheating. But to loop back, our jurisdiction derives through contract because as you'll probably know, in esports, there is no governing body. So in normal circumstances, if you had an anti-corruption code, a player code of conduct that dealt with cheating, doping, match fixing, uh, as we do, that would be 
uh, a rule or regulation of the governing body and it would apply to all players and uh, members of the governing body but in esports no such thing exists um, and esports as a term is somewhat misleading in that regard because it's a bit like saying the olympics it, the olympics is you know 26 or 28 different sports and esports is you know 40 different sports with their own communities their own rules their own owners their own structures and so we have to really look at this on a on a game by game basis and so what we've done is create the commission as a members association it's owned by the members and so it, in effect we are a voluntary regulator and we acquire jurisdiction over a tournament uh, organizers events tournaments leagues because they agree to our to implement our anti-corruption code and our terms of membership and what that means is that when let, let's use um uh, ESL as an example as one of our members when a player or team signs up to play in an ESL event they agree that they are playing subject to the ESIC anti-corruption code which is the rules relating to betting and that agreement gives us jurisdiction to uh, investigate and if necessary prosecute the um, the breaches of that code and you asked about you know so what size of market do we cover and I think it's worth noting that uh, in terms of match fixing, there are only three games that really, really matter in the gambling world because they, they, they make up between them uh, well over 70% of the entire worldwide market. And that's Counter-Strike, Dota 2 and League of Legends. They are utterly dominant. And the two Valve titles, Counter-Strike and Dota 2, between them, uh, come close to 70% of the world's market just between those two games. And so luckily, in a sense, um, because Valve don't really care and don't get involved in this as a publisher, they run um, a very loose um, structure around the use of their games for esports purposes, very light licensing conditions. And so the running of Counter-Strike and Dota 2 tournaments is outside of the majors is very much in the hands of tournament organizers and so our members are the people running dota 2 and counter-strike not exclusively but in those areas we probably cover as an organization at tier one and two level probably 60 to 70 percent of all counter-strike uh, and all and most of dota 2 dota 2 is the biggest problem worldwide currently um, and that's particularly because it's so popular in CIS and, as Alex said, CIS region and China. If you removed match fixing in CIS and China region uh, of all esports, you would remove 80 to 85 percent of all match fixing in esports. Um, and currently in China, mainland China, Counter Strike and Dota 2, and I, you know, I'm here. This isn't just my estimate of it but coming directly from license holders and tournament organizers in China and my intelligence sources in the betting community there, uh, about probably close on 80% of all matches in China are fixed to some extent or other. So if you want to take something away from this, don't bet on Chinese Dota 2 or Counter-Strike because unless you're in on the fix, you're getting fleeced. Um, but that's something that needs to be addressed. It is the biggest single integrity problem in esports right now is the, uh, the match manipulation in uh, mainland China CS region in Dota 2 and Counter-Strike. That's not to say other games aren't fixed or aren't problematic, but in terms of size of markets and liquidity in markets, they, they barely move the needle. And League of Legends, to give Riot credit, uh, has a very low level problem and it's really down at tier two, three level because Riot exercises very, very good control over their data and their league structure at the top level. And so we get, as for exactly the reasons Alex outlined, high level, well organized, well paid, well monitored with limited data available to the betting companies means that match fixing in league, despite being 11, 12% of the betting market uh, revenue worldwide 
is very, very little relatively. I mean, I think I've only currently got maybe three League of Legends related investigations and they're all bottom level regional stuff. So I've probably missed half your question there, Rodolf, but um, no. uh, hopefully that's given you something to start with. No, no, I, actually, this is excellent. Thanks, Jan, and it definitely echoes what Alex was saying right before you. Uh, just the same, just a few follow-up questions that basically arise of what you have just mentioned. Um, you know, you mentioned investigations, and, and you have also stressed the fact that it's a game-by-game -game approach. You don't have the same purview uh, with respect to each game because each game publisher, which has the, the, the rise of life and death over its own game and therefore the underlying esports organized itself differently and the game is organized differently. So um, in terms of concretely the instruments that you have to investigate, how does that how does that work really? I mean, concretely, how do you do that? Sure. Um, so by far the best way of determining whether or not you ought to be investigating a match uh, tournament league is from the betting evidence. And so ESIC run a global sports uh, suspicious betting alert network involving uh, regulators, data companies, betting operators, and uh, bet monitoring companies. So the likes of the Nevada Gaming Control Board, the United Kingdom Gambling Commission, the Maltese Gaming Authority, and so on, alongside at currently about 25 uh, different betting operators, including, as Stepan will know, Parry Match, who are a great member of ours. Um, so we, we have betting operators that range from large non-endemic sports books like Parimatch, Pinnacle, Betway, uh, Ladbrooks, through to online only, esports only operators like Rivalry, Unicorn, um, uh, then we deal with GG Bet. You know, uh, we have a worldwide range of operators, regulators, data companies like Grid, Bayes, Sport Radar, Bet Genius, Abios, Camby. And then the big monitoring um, operations like Sport Radar's uh, Fraud Detection Service, um, the Global Lotteries Monitoring Service, and the International Betting Integrity Association. And we bind those all together to uh, create an alert system. So any one of those members will alert us to an anomaly in the betting, suspicious or unusual betting. We disseminate that information to the remainder of the network we get the responses in to see if people are seeing the same action or whether somebody can explain why the betting's behaving as it's bet as it's doing. And that then informs me as commissioner about what matches incidents I ought to be investigating. And then obviously if it's an ESIC member tournament organizer where it's happening, then we liaise directly with them around the collection of evidence, what to do, you know, in the short term, medium and long term. And obviously, if the, that match that we're investigating uh, is being played subject to the ESIC code, then that gives me the right to demand evidence, deep, deepen the investigation, and, and then ultimately prosecute if I think there's a case to answer. And so after determining from the betting evidence whether a case ought to be looked at, investigated, the next step for us is always yeah, or not always, but 90% of the time, what you're trying to do is link the players, the team, to the people who place the bets. Now, in esports, um, sometimes that's really easy because these guys are idiots and they'll have their brother or their wife or their dad or their best friend on Facebook doing placing the bets. But sometimes it's more sophisticated, particularly where you're dealing with traditional uh, sports type fixing where in fact it's a betting syndicate from China who are bribing the team in order to fix, that's more difficult because then of course the bets are coming, let's say it's a Peruvian Dota 2 tournament, but all the bets are coming from China. How do you link where the bets are coming from uh, to the players? And that's a challenge sometimes. So, but that that's the main job, right? Is, is for us to show that the, that the players are uh, collaborating, colluding in the fix. And we do that by looking at the match action and having that expertly analyzed to show deliberate underperformance um, and to try and link the betters to the uh, to the players. And then if, if we think we've got a strong enough case on balance of probabilities, we prosecute under the code and see where it goes from there. Mm, I see. Thanks, uh, Yen. Um, it's interesting because 
it's clear that you're the interface, the hub between those different actors. You have even mentioned betting companies, and I understand somehow you work hand in hand with each other. So I, I would like to turn to Stepan. Um, Stepan, based on, on what Yen has just said, um, could you please enlighten us, you know, as to how that works from within the betting companies? Because Yen mentioned those betting patterns that, that might tip you off, but how do you monitor those? And, and when do you uh, believe then that at some point something is going wrong and how does that work internally? Then you, you liaise do you liaise with ESIC right away or are there other processes? I mean, I'm, I'm just a bit curious as to how that works on your end. Uh, hello. Uh, <laughs> thanks for invitation. You know, it, it's very hard and very complicated question to explain at the moment how many, how many attempts and how many tools we have just to understand that we see in our back office uh, some kind of match fixing. Uh, so I prefer just to, uh, as our speakers, to speak uh, about this problem in general. But if to uh, just answer uh, on your question, so we have the patterns of uh, betters. So we understand the way how something would be bet on in the game of Dota, in the game of CSGO. And if you understand that it's something wrong here, for example, just, just give it an example, percentage of the bets of the exact win of two maps. We understand for sometimes it just, uh, we have percentage, 75% of money here, 25% of money here, on this side and on this side. So if you sometimes will see 95% and 5% here, so you have to just think a bit why it in a row, uh, like a six months, it will be percentage like this and here, Something wrong. Why so? Uh, and this is a very simple uh, example because uh, it's a bit complicated to explain to the people who are not mm, place any bet uh, on their life. I understand it and appreciate all of uh, like uh, entertainment that we have uh, uh, on our planet. But you know, uh, the problem exists. So uh, if, if if to come back with the words of Jan about CIS in China, uh, we have South South America and Australia, and uh, they are ready to just take this flag. <laughs> no, uh, no any doubts we, that we have much fixing around the globe, and uh, the reasons. Yeah, the reasons are the main interest in uh, how how can we understand the reasons. The esports itself, <clears throat> we have some kind of mindset that sometimes you can even use cheats. I mean, like if you play in CSGO, sometimes you heard about this. You heard that your friend can use cheats. You know that you can buy cheats and just put it in, inside your computer. And after you will have some advantage. And it's no, you know, it's not a big evil. So sometimes you can try or something like this. And in the traditional sports, everybody from, from the childhood, they're trying to explain that if someone, someone sometime will speak about match fixing with you and you will try to, you will try, yeah? It will ruin your career. So if you want to be a champion, if you want to your career grown up, if you want to take this world, just don't think about this at all. And in esports, because they are young, because they have, uh, okay, I, 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 uh, traditional sports and esports are very, very different about like a psychological things. And uh, in traditional sports, I, I, I'm always trying to compare, always, because as for me, it's just the same industries, but this industry are in time and it, it, it exists at the moment. For example, you know that in South Korea, a lot of people, mm, okay, I can say honestly, they just hate betting. I, I can tell you the reason. Because a lot of people really think that betting ruins StarCraft. Because a lot of people tried and 
started to match fixing because it was one-on-one -on -one games and it was very easy to organize this. To understand how big is problem, I can say you that it's even uh, exist some group of people. It's really groups of people that are uh, trying to collaborate to play against big betting companies. That is why uh, we are trying to always be uh, connected with the, uh, with the ASIC, with the YAN. We are, have uh, some kind of, mm, how can I say it? Not official association about uh, people who are trading esports. We organize a lot of groups and we are trying to exchange information. Even like, guys, take a look on this match. Is this everything is okay right now in your company? And you know why? That we have the same patterns with a, uh, with a core audience in the CIS and the Western Europe, for example. We have to change information every time. And as Jan said before, uh, we have no powerful tool to, how can I say it, uh, to use against this. So everything that we have, to be honest, everything that we have as a betting company, we can try to hit a bit their reputation. So we can try to say that the guys, we have no evidence because we are... <laughs> We are not the judges. We are not like the, the police. We just a private company that are trying to organize entertainment. Because, you know, the match fixing itself, it's a common problem. It, it has a heavy impact on everybody, on betting, on media, on sports, on, on young people, on teams. It has really heavy impact on everybody. And what we can, what we can do, we just can say that the guys, we are here to change situation. And we are trying to like stick together. Every time I'm trying to explain that the guys, please be careful because you can ruin your career. But sometimes I need more powerful tool. For example, uh, in football, in traditional football, because I'm used to work in uh, one of the biggest football club in Eastern Europe for eight years, I know that after all, it's a FC Shakhtar from Donetsk, from Ukraine. I know that sometimes if for example, a football player will break the rule, I don't know, will break the contract or will break the rule of match fixing. Sometimes it's even came, come back to him from UEFA, from FIFA. He could not participate in the big tournaments. And what about esports? It's okay. So you have no evidence. You are maybe mm, match fixed before, but you can still play official tournaments. That is why, as Jan said before, it's very important to have some even uh, agreements between tournament organizers, between such uh, perfect organizations as ASIC, like the guys. We will, we will try to investigate after. Please don't think about this, even don't think about this at the moment. But I think that the IP owners, uh, IP owners, I mean like game publishers, they have to be a bit more aware of this situation because this situation without their participation maybe maybe will be not fixed so fast as as we want my my answer for all of this uh, we have a data and we have a technology on our side uh, maybe in, in in a few years we have to not ex ex exchange these patterns through some chats. We have to exchange it very technologically. We have mm -hmm. to understand how to compare these patterns on the fly. We have to understand how to change this information between the betting companies and the ASIC as fast as possible. And after that, we have to, uh, we have to be brave and we have to make a statement, guys. We have not evidence, but we have a lot of suspicious uh, thoughts about this game. After that, nobody knows what what would uh, what would happen. Uh, so, some how can I say some uh, some some people just can uh, ask. Oh, okay, guys, try to ask the teams to sign the papers between like uh, tournament organizers between. Uh, team itself be between organization and between uh, player as a contract. But what will happen? 
what will happen if someone will break rules and we have the evidence for this? Nothing. So just a lot of people will say, this guy, this, this player, uh, we just catch him and he, he is much fixer, you know, he's no, he's cheater. But, but what, would, what will happen? Nothing. So if a lot of people will know about this, maybe it will ruin uh, somehow his career. So the people, I, I mean, like are the sportsmen, they will, they will just say, no way, we, we, will, not, we, will, we will not play with you. And other, other teams will not sign any contract with him, mm -hmm. future contract, I mean, because they, uh, when they, they just can't go to the internet and understand that he has a bad reputation. But he still has possibility to play. He has, he has still a possibility to uh, participate in big professional tier one tournaments because we have no restrictions from the IP owners. So this is the main, uh, common problem that mm. I don't I, I, I don't know how to solve, uh, but I have possibility to always ask Jan, how can we fix this? <laughs> and so the problem exists. Uh, the industry are very young, and so we have to communicate more, and the technology will help. Thanks, because Stepan. Uh, very grateful for uh, all these explanations. Um, what I understand mainly from what you have just said is that a lot of your means of actions have to do in fact with image and peer pressure among industry actors. You would like to discourage this kind of cheating practices by explaining that this is in nobody's interest. Um, and, and I get that, but I also hear then that your means of actions are limited because as you said, you are a private operator in the market. Uh, and, and Jan, I understand that, you know, even ISIC is, is a bridge be between various actors of the industry when it gets to investigating those cases. So the, the, the question now I would like to put to both of you um, is, is simple, but I think in a way also quite complex and fundamental. Do you think that the match fixing uh, issue can be solved by the industry itself from within? Or do you think that it's going to be necessary to involve more and more uh, governments, you know, uh, state institutions to help and assist with uh, regulating those practices? Uh, perhaps, uh, Jan, if you can, you know, spare a few thoughts on, on this specifically. Yeah, sure. Um, it, it, the fight against match fixing across all sport, everything, you know, esports is absolutely no exception to this, is a multi uh, stakeholder project. This has to involve the sports themselves, the betting operators, the data companies, law enforcement and government, um, and civil society, because we need political will to deal with these problems. You know, out of the 200 and odd countries that uh, are members of the United Nations. I would say conservative, uh, ev even being generous, if eight of those are well regulated from a gambling, a sports betting point of view, I think we were being optimistic. The, and there is practically no international cooperation. So the regulation of gambling, of sports betting, is about 100 years behind the practice of sports betting. And that's because regulation happens at a country level and in America at, at a state level. So in America, you've got 50 different forms of regulation at state level, and then about another 100 tribal authorities. That's just one country. And so the world, uh, the world that attempts to regulate sports betting doesn't take any account of the fact that sports betting is a global uh, activity that could involve a match in one country, players from another country, a betting operator from a third country, a data company from a fourth country, and uh, punters from 20 different countries. And, and yet you've got one authority based in, say, I, I don't know, to pick a country, Ukraine, trying to deal with this um, and at a regulatory level. And so we need international cooperation and we need the political will to drive that. And we need the 
uh, law enforcement to take the problem far more seriously and to be backed by criminal laws that assist them, as they are, for example, in the state of Victoria in Australia, where they regard the sports industry as a major part of their economic activity as a state and therefore re regulate sports betting and have proper criminal laws backed up by a specific sports fraud unit within the Victoria Police wow. to investigate and prosecute these cases. And unless you do that, I mean, anybody in this area will know that, for example, I often supply good solid evidence of criminal activity to police all around the world. And I can tell you, I get about, let's say I do that 15 times a year. If I get two responses, I'm stunned literally stunned. Wow. Usually I'd get no response at all. Um, uh, that, things are improving a little bit because um, the uh, Interpol is doing a far better job of, of coordinating uh, around this area. But we, as I say, we're miles behind and it's certainly not something that esports or any sport can solve on its own. There's just, there's just no chance that you can solve this problem on its own. Um, given as well, I'll add one final point. Anybody who's involved in sports betting integrity will know that the vast bulk of, of revenue, of liquidity in the sports betting market exists in completely invisible markets. Uh, and dark web betting, cash betting, agent betting, mobile phone operations based primarily in South, Southeast Asia, but also worldwide in America and places because sports betting as a is broadly speaking internationally actually an illegal activity broadly speaking and and so that doesn't stop people betting it just stops them betting in a visible yeah. accountable fashion and so yeah. even understanding what's going on in those markets and let's say those markets run at 10 10 times the size of the visible markets how, how do you how do you even get to see inside those to find mm. what what's going on you know and and so everybody needs to get behind this not this we, we couldn't possibly solve this problem as a sport uh, on our own we just can't i hear you thanks Jan. um and i guess this is something that we knew already um we need the help of law enforcement we need the help of the government to regulate the industry, uh, and and you know this is not just intervention of you know the government into the life of people. It's it's really in the interest of of the players themselves that at some point uh, there is this kind of intervention to help uh, combating those uh, plagues. Um, and and you know it's interesting because little by little we we have expanded the scope of our discussion to traditional sports as well because. At the end of the day, when it gets to match fixing, this reality also exists at the level of traditional sports. It, it could perhaps even be that traditional sports can teach esports uh, 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 one thing or two about how to combat those um, those issues. And now, therefore, I am turning to uh, uh, Markian and Miki. Um, uh, Markian um, and and Miki, uh, based on what has just been discussed and based on your practice as uh, dispute lawyers and sport lawyers. Uh, do you believe that there are lessons, specific lessons that esports could learn from match fixing in say uh, football, tennis and, and other sports that are at, at the center of uh, sports betting at an international or national level? Uh, perhaps Markian, you have a few thoughts to spare on the topic? Yes, thank you, Rudolf. I, I have many thoughts and I'm uh, keeping myself from uh, pouring them all in the chat here. There's a very interesting <laughs> discussion clear. going. Uh, but there are obviously uh, many lessons to, to, to be learned from traditional sports, uh, just stemming from the fact that traditional sports had many years and decades of development and refining all these tools. And you're absolutely right that the problems exist. Uh, they exist very manifestly and, and, and our, uh, sports are trying to, to deal with them. Uh, two uh, main things uh, that came to my mind amongst many other thoughts uh, listening to the discussion just now. Uh, one, uh, a, a very important philosophical lesson, if you will, is that in traditional sports, uh, there is no distinction between 
tier one match fixing and tier three or lower match fixing. Every case is treated in a similar way with a similar procedure, similar sanctions. The logic behind this is that match fixing is a cancer. And once it enters the system, and of course it's easier to enter the system at the low level, and if it's left untreated, it will propagate across the system to more to higher levels, to more important competitions, bigger clubs, famous players, and so on. So whenever you have a case like that, it will be treated with uh, you know with all the uh, force of, of sorry, whatever Mark, the law. Yeah, sorry guys, I need to run, just want to say bye. It was uh, like pleasure to meet you all and thank you for attending. Keep in touch, guys. Bye bye. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Uh, completely the same, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> because we are, we are in the same building with Sasha. We have other meetings. So I have to go with the meeting himself. It, it was very nice to have all of you guys. No problem. Thanks Thank for you. joining Thank us. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's really important to, to, to treat these low-level low cases um, equal, with, with equal attention and, and give them equal uh, a level of attitude. Uh, the second thing, and, and this is something that's been uh, discussed in the chat, uh, is that sport, traditional sports have a system in place. Uh, this is a system that is fairly consistent uh, from the top to bottom, from the International Olympic Committee to international federations and both down to, to uh, national governing bodies. Um, and it's a system uh, that works in concert. Uh, it has uh, several different uh, manifestations. Uh, first of all, it's the same standard of zero tolerance. It's the same set of rules and procedures, same uh, level and same, same attitude to sanctions uh, and universal enforcement, which is extremely important and addresses some of the issues that were discussed today that when um, an individual is sanctioned on a low national level, that individual is effectively banned elsewhere worldwide. That really puts a pressure on that because they cannot just switch to another sport or you know, move to another country and keep playing. So the bans are worldwide. The other important element of the system uh, also has been touched upon today is uh, cooperation with on the, on the one hand, national authorities, law enforcement authorities primarily, and gambling organizations, betting companies. There are only three ways uh, uh, the, uh, the, the match fixing issue or evidence about match fixing can, can see the light of day. One in very rare cases is through a whistleblower. That of course is self-explanatory. Second is through accidental uh, uncovering through investigation of other matters. There have been mm -hmm. wonderful examples of that when the police was, was uh, investigating uh, organized crime uh, throughout Central and Eastern Europe. It came across uh, about a, a, an entire organization that was uh, doing the match fixing, the so-called Bochum case. Um, and, and, uh, and that uh, sort of uh, kick-started the, the, the practice and the series of, of cases that ended up before the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Uh, and on the other hand, co cooperation with, with betting authorities, with betting companies providing information and patterns with respect to those cases that are specifically linked to, uh, to betting. Uh, in 2010, uh, UEFA, the football governing body, introduced a system that is called uh, uh, betting fraud detection system, which is essentially a flow of information that is refined through algorithms to identify spikes in, in frequency and volume of, of bets on particular uh, events, matches, or, or, or competitions. And whenever there is a spike, the red flags go, go up. And then experts look at that and try to identify uh, uh, what's going on. And that system has been proved uh, to be legally viable. And, and Court of Arbitration for Sport has indeed uh, based its awards on that system uh, in, in addition to, um, to, other, um, to other evidence. So these are the, the elements that really uh, esports should esports community should really look at and try to adopt. Of course, esports is very different because it is decentralized. There isn't yeah. a governing body, as Ian said. Everything is based effectively through contracts uh, and, and and contractual submission. Uh, but in the end of the day, to make the system work, it has to be universal. It does not have to be a standalone governing body. There isn't really uh, one in uh, in traditional sports. But traditional sports is in some ways a pyramid on top of, of which is the pyramid of legal system on top of which is the court of arbitration for sports. Mm -hmm. Same applies to doping, by the way, which will be discussed later, uh, but same, same system discussed. 
Uh, and the way that esports should really look at the problem uh, is look at it through legal eyes. Because we've been talking about sanctions and blacklists. Well, blacklisting is a, is a legal sanction. And if it does not have proper legal foundation behind it, the blacklisted individual will just go to a court, challenge it, and possibly win and, and frustrate the whole system. So the, the esports community really has to take the lesson from traditional sports in the sense that it has to be a legal system built on four elements, prevention, uh, detection and investigation, prosecution, uh, and enforcement. And it has to involve all the stakeholders. It, has, it absolutely has to involve the publishers. I completely agree with Ian mm -hmm. here because the publisher is something that doesn't really exist in traditional sports no. because th that sport is not owned by anyone. But mm -hmm. publishers are really the, the, the source of, of the whole thing. Uh, the event organizers, teams, players, sponsors, all of them have to be bound by rules that are extremely strict. For example, we've uh, again something that we've talked about today was the issue of reporting. You know what happens if something is reported or not reported. Well, in sports and football, particularly, that's solved really uh, easily. Uh, failure to report is equivalent to match, match fixing of offense itself. Mm -hmm. There is a very famous case of a Ukrainian, incidentally, referee uh, Oleg Rechov, that was approached some years ago with an offer to fix a match that he was refereeing. Uh, he refused. Um, everything went fine. His officiating was brilliant, but he didn't report that to anyone. As a result, he was banned for life. Wow. And that really sent a message uh, to the community that reporting is as important as, you know, not doing it uh, yeah. effectively itself. And that is then compounded on, on other layers. For example, the roles of uh, sponsors is really important. Sponsors like to have what we call integrity clauses in their contracts which means to say that if a company, if a team that is sponsored by that particular sponsor fails to observe these rules, mm. the contract will be terminated. Same in relations between teams and the players. So throughout the system, it has to be like this one you know, red line that has to tie the whole system uh, together in, in a very legal way. There, there isn't really a way to find it without it going legal. So uh, as, as somebody has said, lawyers are just looking at it and, and, and waiting to see what happens uh, mm -hmm. in sports. Thanks, Mark. I, I think it's the dream of many uh, to have a, a, a similar umbrella as, as CAS for esports, uh, perhaps uh, that, that would materialize soon. Uh, I, at least we can only wish for that to happen. Um, Mickey, <laughs> turning to you, um, uh, and, and based on Mark Ian's uh, own comments, what's your take on, on the situation right now based on traditional sports? And what do you see could be bridges between those traditional sports and, and esports uh, in terms of, of uh, combating cheating, generally speaking, in the industry? Well, first off, thanks for having me. Um, I just want to say hi to my students who I kind of required to join this, this panel right now. So thanks for coming over. Thanks also for having me in the panel. The good thing about being the last person to speak is I don't have to speak much because Markian and Ian really talked about almost everything that I wanted to discuss. <laughs> um, but I do agree with Markian. Um, there are a lot of things that we can learn from traditional sports. I like the example of UEFA and with FIFA having an early warning system when it comes to betting and getting data from like legitimate betting houses. And I think that's what, what Ian does with ESIC. Um, the problem, though, at least localized here in the Philippines, is because sports betting isn't that popular. Well, it is popular, but it's not legit and regularized. So we do have regular sports betting houses. Um, we don't have the infrastructure like ESIC has of studying data from the betting houses. So we can't really have an early warning system for that. But even if we do, most of the betting here is illegal, meaning it's like someone texting another person, having a telegram group, or messaging someone on Facebook. Um, so it's going to be hard to get data from that end. Um, but I agree with everything Markian said. It has to be all the stakeholders coming together, whether it's the government passing stricter laws, um, dealing with the publishers, such as I think Valve blacklisted a, a Filipino a couple of years ago for match fixing. He's banned completely from any Valve event. The thing is that Filipino decided, okay, I'm not going to play Dota anymore. I'm going to transfer and start playing Mobile Legends. Yeah. And he's doing it. And he's allowed to do it because 
again, there's no overarching regulatory mechanism mm-hmm. for everything. So it's a struggle. Um, it's a struggle, I mean, for, for developed countries like the UK and esports developed countries like, like Ukraine and, and the CIS. But imagine this, the, the structural problems we have in a, in a country like the Philippines, right? Where it will be easy to entice a young high schooler who's a prodigy in a certain game for a $200, $300 to throw, throw a game and no one will know the better of it. Like the, the, the kid who got caught match fixing in 2015, I think he was given less than $1,000 to, to, to fix a game, right? So it's not much in the eyes of everyone else, but it's a lot here in the Philippines. Mm, so yes. I don't know how that's going to be solved um, because it's easy to have like these big ideas, but a lot of things fall between the cracks, especially in countries like here in the Philippines. So mm. thanks, Mark Ian, for saying everything I wanted to say in a more uh, eloquent manner. Uh, thanks, Nikki. Um, perhaps just one follow-up question, because you say that betting uh, on, on sports is not really regulated. It's borderline illegal, or in fact, just illegal in the yes. Philippines. Uh, but I suppose th- th- there might have been some match-fixing scandals nonetheless, because somehow people are still betting on those sports and there are still financial stakes arising yeah. from games. So do you, do you have any sort of example to entertain us with, uh, uh, you know, uh, regarding, you know, past match-fixing scandals that might have happened either in the Philippines or in Asia more generally? Uh, well, eSports match-fixing, the one I mentioned, the past 2015, yes. it was a daughter tournament. Yes. And then actually last week, there was a match-fixing <laughs> allegation um, in a mobile legends game that was funny because one of the world champions or it's a team from the philippines they played in the local league here in the philippines they lost their first two matches right and then one of the team members of that team that lost like like a few minutes after the loss posted like a wad of cash with the caption easy money right so everyone is saying why did you do that um that's obviously match fixing but the guy came out and said um, in, in the vernacular saying, look, it wasn't match fixing, can't be loose once in a while. This money that I'm posting, it's actually because uh, it came from a business that I have with my wife. All right. So, I mean, sure. I think that's one of the things that can be fixed. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might be hard to fix structurally, but teams should be able to, and tournament organi- organizers should be able to educate their players, at least not to have any semblance of impropriety because whether it's real impropriety by match fixing or a mere semblance of it will affect the integrity of the game, right? Eventually, that guy who posted a wad of cash was, I think he was penalized or fined a uh, few thousand pesos for impropriety. Mm, well, that that okay. happened just like last week. Okay, well, thanks for that very recent uh, example. That's kind of an interesting story. Um, that whole husband and wife business. Um, All right, well, I can see we have just a few minutes left. And in fact, there have been quite a few questions asked and answered in the chat. Um, But but perhaps we have time for one or or two more questions from the audience, if any. Um, So perhaps I would encourage the participants right now to manifest themselves uh, in case there is any question they would want to ask to one of our remaining uh, panelists. Rolf, do you want me to cold call one of my students to ask? <laughs> that would be cruel. <laughs> yeah, I won't do that. Okay. <laughs> there is one from Nick. Um, one from Nick. Hi. Yes, Nick, please. Oh, uh, thanks very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, I would like to uh, ask. Well, it's a general question uh, about collection of evidence for. Um, for the allegations of uh, fixing. Uh, if in sports, uh, we know that there have been tapes uh, recorded, how to procure this type of evidence in on the cyber arena and which standards of admissibility would be applicable to them? Thank you. 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you from a practical point of view, Nick, um, from our side of things, uh, our code gives us the ability to demand evidence, for example, mobile phone, bank account, that type of stuff. But of course, having the right under a code to do that and actually getting it are two very, very different things because whenever we demand it from any player or team, of course, they go to ground, disband, disappear, um, simply refuse. And of course, we don't have, you know, uh, legal powers to go and actually obtain or take that evidence. Um, we need law enforcement to do that. And in some jurisdictions, we get that help from, say, Victoria Police in Australia or the FBI in America. But broadly speaking, the compilation of evidence is, is, a, is a tough thing. But what we rely on, and this is where um, esports has an advantage over traditional sports, is that we're, we're, we're a digital product and therefore we're extremely data heavy. And so, for example, if... Um, Let's say in, in traditional sport where something happens and you get an expert along to say that that, that was done on purpose. I'll take a cricket example. No, cricket would be a bad idea. Let's say a guy misses an open goal in football. So he's got this really easy shot from 10 yards out. He's passed the goalkeeper and he misses the goal. And we have betting evidence that, that you know, he was deliberately trying to lose. Um, but you can get an expert to come along and say, yes, he missed that on purpose, but you'll easily get a, 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 an expert of equal standing to say, no, this happens every day. It's just bad play. It's just bad luck. The ball bobbled up and he missed, right? But in esports, what we have is very, particularly for, for you know, players who have been around for a long time, is a, is a very compelling digital footprint of how they normally play. And so in some of my investigations, we, we can say that in this particular clutch moment, this, this player, 98% of the time he does X, but in this game that we're investigating, he does Y. Now that's not conclusive, but it's certainly very good corroborative evidence when you put it against the betting evidence, the remainder of the match evidence, and particularly obviously if you can link the player to the betting evidence. So if you you can link the player to the person who placed the bet, then you've you've got easily a compelling enough case when your when your balance when your um, uh, burden of proof is on balance of probabilities. Clearly, if you're going for beyond reasonable doubt, you're absolutely stuffed. But that's true of every sport. You know, I mean, esports is no exception. So we have some advantage given the digital nature of the sport. But we have the disadvantage, which was identified by Mark Ian and, and Mickey to some extent, is that we don't have universal standards. You know, E6, E6 anti-corruption code is as close as you get to a universal standard across the esports world. And we rely, we're 100 percent reliant on tournament organizers, publishers, leagues signing up and voluntarily submitting to our code. And because Obviously, if we one of the features of the ESIC organization is that if we ban somebody uh, for behavior in one of our member tournaments, they banned across all of our member tournaments. So that effect of um, that you get in traditional sport, where if you're banned for match fixing in English football, you're banned across the whole of football through through FIFA's regulations. We, we replicate that to some extent, but theoretically, the player we ban could go to a non-ESIC member and play. But fortunately, most of the non-members of ESIC, most tournament organizers do honor our bans despite not being members. So they will just refuse entry to those players. But that's not a universal rule. As, as we've identified, we've got players moving from Counter-Strike into Valorant. Now, can Riot stop them playing Valorant um, because of what they did when they were playing Counter-Strike? Well, uh, watch the space. We're working on that. Thanks, Ian. Um, if, if I maybe can add two words on, on top of that, um, because, the again, traditional sports have had possibility to, to, to work with that. And there are two things that, that were worked out through, through practice. One, uh, Ian has alluded to, to a standard of proof. Uh, in, in, in these cases, uh, beyond reasonable doubt is not required. Uh, it has to, it, the, the standard of proof is called the comfortable satisfaction. 
which uh, Cass says has to be lower than the reasonable doubt, beyond reasonable doubt, but higher than balance of probabilities. So there you have one step down from what's required in a, for a criminal conviction. The other is the way that Cass developed for looking at the evidence and uh, and evaluating the evidence. The lack of subpoena power by these sports-based investigative bodies is apparent. So all the tidbits of evidence that are able indeed together looked upon critically, uh, should I say favorably in favor of the, of, of the prosecution. Uh, that, that's the second step, step down. The rest of it, uh, unfortunately, is still legal. Uh, still, still same rules have to apply for admissibility of evidence. So, you know, secretly procured recording does not necessarily will work. Um, and from that point of view, as I said before, cooperation with betting industry and cooperation and collaboration with law enforcement still is very, very, very relevant. Thanks, Markian, uh, and thanks, Nick, for the question. Uh, I am afraid the clock is inexorably ticking, um, and we're already running a little bit behind schedule by just four minutes. Uh, thanks again, Nian, Markian, Miki, and, and Stepan and Alex, who, who's left already. Thanks again. Very informative, very exciting discussions. Uh, I will now hand over to uh, Leo, Leonid, for the next of our panel on doping and e-doping. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Chibon, I've got to go you. as well. I'm sorry, Leonid. I'm just saying goodbye because I've got to go. Thanks, guys. It was really Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I have to go as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you, Mickey. You. So uh, we have a really tight schedule since we're processing without a break to panel two, which will be a little bit shorter and we'll discuss doping and e-doping. I'm happy to welcome uh, three speakers on this panel. First, uh, I will start with Nick Williams, who is a barrister uh, from Morgan Sports Law. Uh, his practice encompasses commercial employment and regulatory disputes that arise in the context of both sports and esports. So we will have someone who will be able to speak about doping and especially e-doping in sports and explain what e-doping is. And as a second panelist, we have uh, Michelle Perrochem, if I pronounce the surname correctly, uh, who is uh, the founding director of Sporting Integrity. She is a former director of ethics and anti-doping at UK Sports. So we have a true um, doping expert here who will also help contributing us on a discussion on how far doping and e-doping got in esports. And last but not least, uh, Alexander Volkov, counsel from Asterisk uh, in Kiev, who will also be speaking about his experience in doping uh, in esports. So uh, let me start with the first question to Michelle um, and to ask her about the particularities of doping and e-doping in esports. I mean, it's a kind of different uh, field than it is in real sports where uh, doping is to increase physical strength or endurance or stamina or whatever. What are What is the doping that we encounter in esports? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, one thing I should actually say is I'm also a director of ESIC, and my specific role there is anti-doping. And so, you know, it's something that uh, having been a long time in the anti-doping world for traditional sports, given the opportunity to look at esports, uh, I really wanted to see if we could do something differently. Because yes, where you have uh, e-versions of traditional sports, so like, you know, sort of Zwift, Peloton cycling, there's every reason to consider the traditional approach to anti-doping. Uh, but in the tier one e-sports that you've been discussing earlier on in terms of match fixing, of course, there there is an opportunity to, to approach this differently. And uh, we certainly did when invited by uh, Ian in terms of the threat assessment that we needed to make, we looked really at 
what is it that really concerns the players? And that is a completely different approach than the imposed anti-doping rules in the hierarchical structure that you see in the, uh, the world anti-doping system currently. Uh, so we took it sort of bottom up, player upwards, because there had been so many claims that um, Adderall was being widely used and this is the drug of choice for anybody in esports. And uh, certainly when you have that kind of threat, you're looking at it from the perspective of if this is truly a threat, can we focus in on this particular drug itself? Because looking at the way that esports is played, uh, for the most part, it, it is about the, the stimulation of the body, the focus, you know, are people trying to enhance their performance by using stimulant drugs is really what we asked ourselves do we care if they're using steroids well on a health basis perhaps we might but is it going to make them a, a, any better at esports probably not and so we were able to rewrite the rule book to focus on the stimulant drugs and to manage any other substances that might be of concern and we've done that really through ESIC by the players make helping to design the rules and this really was was our starting point we felt that if we understood better what it was that the players wanted to see controlled and more recently they're starting to ask us to consider cannabis as a means of uh, relaxation away from the um the arena or, or or the the screen so it does look like they're looking wider at the health uh of the the players but we need to make sure that what we're doing is taking taking everybody with us we do this by consent and we apply then the rigor of the world anti-doping system when it comes to the level of analysis the uh the strict liability uh on the uh um the the investigation and subsequent prosecution of cases but because we use saliva oral fluid testing which is much cheaper much easier and also provides you with a very solid evidence chain we're currently working on a virtual testing platform and we would obviously then be able to record what it is that we're, we're doing by way of a test and that might in actual fact roll out further uh, but for the most part if you think that people want to be the top of their game get into those big arena events and we've been able to go in there and unlike traditional sports we have been able to test everyone every day after every match so uh, it just seems that we using the flexibility now at the time of course we we have the players really engaged it's a very short process and the um the nice thing is we've been able to then continue to survey them again unlike traditional sports there is a survey that goes on at every test and so we have you know, one would say if we were if we were really in the, the sort of business of uh, anti doping, uh, but we're looking more at the integrity of esports here. Um, if we're in the business of anti doping, we get a top rating from our consumers. Um, but uh, it really is about we want to understand what it is the players are concerned about, want to see stopped, and really that that's been our starting point. So using um, laboratories that operate the WADA standards for analysis, collection of two samples, one of which is analysed, one of which would be the uh, defence sample, if you like, the reserve that could be analysed in the event that we have a, a finding. And I'm going to pause there because obviously the next question is going to be about, um, you know, what have we found, but we'll, um, we'll just, uh, just so you can take on board this very different approach. Now, I do know my colleagues in um, some of the other uh, e -ver versions of sports such as FIFA or whatever have brought in the anti-doping organizations and I do know that ESL who are our main um, partners in this um, did try and partner with um, a national anti-doping organization to collect urine samples post game but quite honestly there's a broader uh, uh, 
list of substances you are looking for, which would be very difficult to justify in terms of what we're trying to regulate. We're trying to regulate cheating, we're trying to allay the concerns of the players, and we're trying to stop people feeling, I have to use Adderall to win, because the honest answer is, they that isn't being used by the winners I see. There you go. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a good you, you already answered some of my question that I would have further um, but on what kind of contract do you operate with um, publishers or with organizers when you're taking the, these tests is it a contract that ESIC has with them is it something that the players have to sign once they join the tournament or how is it um, achieved well, it, it's achieved really through one membership of, of ESIC and you can sign up to um, the anti-corruption uh, code. You can also adopt the anti-doping policy and it, it is primarily through that membership arrangement, but it's then for the um, either the host organizer of uh, a league, a, a tournament, what, whatever, to regard this as a condition of eligibility to participate so it, it really in, embraces everyone in the partnership do they want to see this being a doping free environment when we consider e-doping being primarily around about the stimulant drugs that could be used um, and and that of course has enabled the partnership to grow to include um, the, the teams themselves and we offer team education and uh, um, that's been uh, something that the team management have really uh, taken on board understood the common sense they don't want people breaching a code of conduct that they may have put in place so we can actually be helpful in that respect but it is really something where we've still yet to tackle um, publishers but I do wonder from a publisher's point of view um, do you really have a, a, a genuine concern or a genuine responsibility for whether or not people who play your games are alcoholics, wife beaters, wh whoever? Do you have that general concern? What we need to focus on is this is about the cheating that goes on in a competitive environment. And, and I think focus in on that. And, and we've been able to do that which does separate it from the other types of anti-doping work that I do, which look at uh, what it is that athletes are doing outside of uh, the actual competition as well. And, and uh, following up on that, I think uh, Markian had a question that he asked in the chat, which was, uh, let me... Um, <laughs> Read it out to you. How do you see the interaction and the alignment with WADA? Well, it's an interesting situation. Uh, do we need to be in alignment? This is a different industry. Yes, there are esports that want to be part of. I've just been reading now one going to the Asian Games. Um, that is their choice, obviously, uh, in terms of how they want to interface with esports, which is a really broad church of activities. But we're, we're looking at a, a particular tier of esports, the top tier, um, where there is a lot of league play, arena play, where we're focusing in on competitions itself. Um, WADA might want to learn from us because we've been able to undertake a type of testing that has given such an extensive level of coverage. I mean, to be able to say at an Olympic Games, we've tested every athlete every day would be a marvellous achievement and cost them millions. We've been able to look at real focus and being able to engage with the players because we have asked them what should be on that list, what really concerns you and that you do not want to see. So it is that engagement rather than the imposition that makes us uh, approach it differently through ESIC. I can just jump in. I mean, yeah. Michelle, as an athlete focused lawyer, this is absolute music to my ears. Um, I, I, I think what ESIC's doing around 
sort of education and focus on that kind of thing rather than purely the prosecution of doping offences. This imposition of a certain rule set is, is tremendously impressive and it's, it's really encouraging that esports can, can have its own approach to these kinds of issues, which can be better than what we see in traditional sport. Thank you, Nick. I mean, that's it's wonderful coming from you and, and congratulate you on all the work you're doing there at Morgan Sports Law, because, you know, if you impose rules on people, they don't really own them. And the difference here is that the players own these rules. If they said tomorrow, and they have asked us about these, uh, these questions, you know, sort of, um, what about nicotine? Very, very difficult. I mean, nicotine's been sitting on the, the World Anti-Doping Agency uh, monitoring list for a long, long time. Do I ever think that nicotine will be banned? No. So what are we monitoring for? I know there's this concern about keeping the door open, but what we want to try and create it, it through ESIC is that certainty of knowledge that we are doing an extensive level of testing and, and we hear, you know, the players are there with us saying, well, I'm glad you got the winning team in as well as the losing team, because whatever they're on, we want to be on it too. And of course, there's lots of, of, of laughter and, and, and banter between the teams, because as we can bring back the results to say, to be honest, there's nothing there. I think what we're trying to do is say, if you're skilled, you won't need to try and look outside of, of yourself. What you have to do is have the confidence in yourself. And the talk with the team psychologists uh, is exactly the same uh, situation where they say, you know, we are delighted to see that what you're trying to do is say, look, this is a distraction. And what we're trying to do is create a level of certainty for you. We're not saying it will never happen. But I would say in the uh, we've done over 400 tests in the very short time we've been operating this program. Uh, the last event we were out, IEM Katowice, you know, 100 percent testing. And what have we re reported on? I've got a couple of low level party drugs that that were below the reporting level that we had a chat with the players and said, look, we don't think your management will be very impressed with you taking these kind of substances so close to a tournament. Now think about your employment contract here and, uh, and, and just, you know, think about where you're going in the future. And it might sound a little bit like I'm acting like their mother. Maybe that's how they see me. I don't know. But they are fabulous guys who get it. And I wish I could say the same about athletes in other sports. Maybe I, I can jump in right there. Would you consider that what you're explaining is more like a mediation process that could help uh, in the esports scene as an alternative dispute resolution forum to not ban players right away if their court was doping, but to educate them through mediation and show them the consequences which doping might have on their relationship with their sponsors, with their employers, with the tournament organizers, etc. It may very well be the way forward. I mean, I, I think the difficulty has been in the traditional sporting world. Um, they have been uh, fighting a problem probably from the wrong place. They started with a pharmacological list. Uh, they started with the imposition of testing and the tightening up of testing processes. And uh, it's only really, uh, you know, I've been around for a very long time pre the World Anti-Doping Code as well. But um, that 20 years of the code and we're only now seeing engagement of the athletes and and you know knowing that i wanted to start with ian from a different place with ESIC and said look let's not let's not surprise them with our version of testing let's go in and ask them and then explain to them how this type of testing can be equally as sophisticated it doesn't maybe look as sophisticated but equally as sophisticated from the point of view of the analysis, the collection of evidence follows all the same uh, standards that you would expect in any forensic situation. And so what we do have is that great opportunity. And, and actually it's, it's, it's becoming one of those situations where the players are so good at this, I would willingly sign them all up tomorrow as my testing officers. So that, that leads me to Nick, maybe you can explain or tell us from your experience what from conventional sports could be maybe implemented in fighting doping in the esports scene 
Sure. Uh, I mean, it's a good question. And I, I think sort of the fundamental principle that exists behind the Wada Code, preserving the spirit of sport, mm -hmm. it holds as true for esports as it does for sport. But we have to be really, really careful in assuming that doping in the way it's handled in traditional sport is, is the right way to go about approaching doping in the context of esports. They're uh, more different than they are similar. Um, certainly in the way that it's governed, you don't have those systems around, um, you know, you don't have this top-down governance structures, you don't have widespread testing in uh, esports as you do in sport. Uh, I mean, the testing is largely at the moment through uh, initiatives like ESIC concentrated very much at a few tournaments at the very top level of esports. It's not something that filters down all the way to these, these different levels. Um, but I, I think the, the, what ESIC's done with its anti-doping code, taking those things that you see in the WADA code, you know, a lot of the language that's in it largely mirrors what you see in the code, the, in the ESIC anti-doping code that exists. And then adapting it so it's it's more appropriate. They have a very short prohibited list, ESIC, for example, and it almost entirely focuses on uh, stimulant instruments like Adderall, um, and they have a system for TUEs, uh, all of that stuff which you, you do need to have in place, but making it more appropriate for uh, the kind of issues that you you do see in esports. I think that's that's incredibly valuable. Um, I mean, I'm I'm actually quite interested to to ask Michelle a question, not to not to bounce off to someone else. Go ahead. <laughs> whether she sees any value in extending testing in a broad way across esports, because I've heard what she said, you know, they've carried out 400 doping tests across the last five or six years that ESIC's been doing its thing. Um, but almost all of those have been at ESL run competitions. Um, I mean, doping does seem to be a problem in esports, probably not at the very top of it. Um, though possibly in games like Call of Duty. Um, but it, it certainly seems to be an issue in, in some esports at the mid levels. Uh, whether she sees a future rollout of, of that kind of doping testing uh, or whether you, she thinks it's always going to be, I say she, Michelle, whether you think it's always going to be concentrated right at the top. Um, I mean, it, we have to think about the purpose of it, I think. But you're absolutely right, Nick. Um, should it go further? in terms of the qualifiers so you know certainly yes what i i know of obviously is the the major arena um uh testing but we do put the testing team in for the um online uh qualifiers for the teams who are there going right the way through and um uh, then you know sort of uh it, it does mean obviously that the the players are coming in you know several days running uh, if particularly if they're winning um and uh that sort of helps to reinforce the 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 objective you know do you need drugs to uh, that we're trying to find out do you need drugs to win but if we look at uh how people might qualify it is entirely possible in my view to make uh, a virtual drug test part of that qualification. Yes, of course, everybody can manipulate uh, 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 you know, a doping test. We, we see that happening in, in uh, the traditional sports world. However, what we're trying to raise is the integrity of this. We're trying to actually say, you do not need drugs to be able to be as good as you can be. And if you really thought about the pharmacological effects of these substances, a stimulant to your body might actually make you make the wrong decision. And that's something that most players do not want to do because there's, there's, a, there's as much competition as, you know, to be in the team uh, and, and to make the right decisions. And sometimes the decision is not to do something as it is to do something. And you cannot control your your the 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 effect on the body in quite the same way if you're playing under the influence of substances i think yeah, there were... sorry it's, it's a really good point i mean yeah. i i think the sort of challenge um for me six perspective is is getting publishers perhaps to to realize the value in having these kinds of initiatives mm -hmm. because yeah. sorry go ahead 
I was going to say, but the balance is what we're trying not to do is, you know, you don't go along to your wherever or download something, um, a game, and then suddenly a, a drug testing kit arrives at your home. We've got to try and mm. get the balance. And that's, I think, the, the, the future challenge. If you want to engage with a competitive structure so that you do have that formal joining education to consent to to be to want to be part of it uh, and if you're not prepared to um to sign up to that kind of level of integrity then by all means continue to play your esports games elsewhere without being part of the bigger picture so you would also that is what you're envisaging is roll out these tests and testing ahead of online tournaments I, I think it's entirely possible to do that what we really want to see is the the you know the bigger engagement we're fortunate at the moment esl have been the the, the you know the key um to opening this up in in the esports world but they cannot do this on their own and we do have to look at uh, some of the other games that we started with you know we've had a look at dota and 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 you know we we know that there isn't a, a yet a, a a full willingness to, to to have drug testing at the tournaments. Now we would say all the time we would precede all of this with you know player education, management education as well. And I think it makes huge sense. And the sponsors themselves should be pushing for this because if you really want to be associated with some pretty you know serious uh, concerns you know with addict addiction really that's really where we're going and and we may have to look at what are the liabilities for teams where they do discover a player has an addiction to a substance it may not even be um you know uh, on our prohibited list but what are you actually going to do about that person just end their contract do you have no duty there so I think that the whole player welfare issue it has to now start to be um, really the main the, the main topic of conversation for those who are involved in the esports industry. And Alexander, what what is your experience in in Ukraine? Is there is the Ukrainian esports association fighting with doping, or what is happening at the moment? Uh, well, well, Anit, uh, thanks for uh, for this question. And I, I would I would say that I, I cannot uh, speak about the Ukrainian associations, but I would I would uh, point out some uh, some issues that uh, popped up in our uh, experience with Markian in in, in similar uh, doping and e doping cases. Uh, first of all, it's a, it is a um, we believe that there there may be or there is already a clash between these systems between the vada systems and uh, essex system on fighting the doping because, because and the boiler uh question here is whether esports is a sport if the answer is positive and we say yes esports is a sport then uh purely by the application of the local laws and fight and doping uh esports athletes may be subjected to other regulations and anti-doping control and we've seen that in regular sports when um a ukrainian uh, non-professional athlete that is 50 plus may travel to france uh for a vacation with his wife and may be subject to to the doping controls of the local uh, of the uh, French anti-doping uh, doping agency, and then subject to 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 sanctions proceedings. The same may happen, uh, and as you may have heard, in Ukraine, uh, esports is an official sport. So um, a lot of athletes that were involved you know, uh, uh, and engage on a pro level in, in the esports may may be considered as a, as a sports uh, athletes and may fall. Uh, under the jurisdiction of the of the purely definitions and uh, uh, of the athletes under their respective regulations, for example, uh, and as far as I know, the uh, the Polish law on anti-doping uh, it, it it allows such application. And here, when we understand that uh, while the esports athletes may travel and may be subject to to local 
uh, anti-doping regulations, there is, uh, there is a clash between the systems and between the lists that Michelle was saying that the list uh, of ASIC is shortened, while the VADA uh, list is, 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 is really big. So for example, you can, you can the athlete, or you can take uh, a pill or drug against, uh, and, against uh, losing the, fa uh, the fat, uh, or, and weight, but in the end of the day, uh, that would be useless for uh, your performance in uh, esports. But that may still be a subject to prohibition under the VADA list. So um, there may be problems in future, and still, um, yeah. Esports uh, has its own regulations, as we heard, and how these two systems will develop uh, jointly. Uh, it, it is to be seen, but still, uh, in the future, there is a need to to have some models of branding between the VADA and ASIC and how they work together, because because in inevitably uh, esports. Uh, should be considered as basically as a sport uh, in, in, in a purely formalistic perspective, or there should be strict lines to, to delineate these uh, esports from the regular sport because uh, it's, it's, it's a t uh, too complicated system uh, that works uh, together. And finally, my, uh, my last point would be about the contract application uh, with respect to the doping. And we know a lot about the Lance Armstrong and his, and his doping cases. But what we uh, do not know a lot are the follow-up lawsuits uh, by uh, the sponsors of Lance Armstrong uh, and uh, uh, with respect to his anti-doping infringements because they hurt it, the image of, of his sponsors and they um, asked for their money back, back and the sponsorship agreements he had for millions of dollars. And this is something also worth considering because, because of um, esports athletes and esports teams are heavily engaged in the sponsorship agreements and any misconduct, and this goes uh, both to e-doping and match fixing may adversely affect uh, not only the team's perspective, but also the athlete's per perspective. And uh, the athletes and the sponsors and the teams may fi find themselves in a heavily uh, and a bitter disputes where they would need to prove a fact, whether there was a match fixing or there was indeed a fact of the anti-doping infringement. So all the, those issues are popping up and they will pop up because, because the system developed. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainty because there is no unified uh, body to govern that. And we are kind of uh, uh, in abyss what, what will uh, be in the future. But there are lawyers, there are enthusiasts, there is ASIC. So, um, probably uh, in the end of the day, we will find ourselves in a specialized esports system with unified governing body where all organizers of the esports events, IP holders, uh, athletes, uh, and integrity units uh, will work together and have a more structured system. And uh, thank you, Alexander, that it was really insightful. Um, mm -hmm. Before we come to the the questions from uh, the audience, I would also like to ask all of you uh, a question on e-doping, especially on cheating. I mean, we've been talking now about uh, the chemical doping, about pills that uh, try to help uh, concentration, etc. However, there are cases where players introduce codes or introduce cheats into the competition. Is it also something where ASIC is intervening and uh, maybe is it something that is illegal under domestic and national laws you have been talking about, Alexander? And what is your experience in general? Well, uh, from my perspective, it hasn't been something that um, ASIC has had uh, uh, a, lo a lot of involvement with because obviously some of the major um, uh, 
cases have been very easy for the referees themselves to pick up on. And uh, I think uh, it, it, it spoke volumes when we saw um, the, the, you know, somebody trying to rescue their, um, their, their cheat bot um, before it was actually uh, discovered by somebody else. And, and, and I think, you know, what Alexandra said is, uh, you know, is quite important here because if somebody is found to have e-doped and they can be outed and then banned, that can be a ban that everybody respects. The problem, of course, we have with the chemical doping is that other people might not respect that ban because we don't have the 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 same system. But when you corrupt your software license, you do so at your peril because that's a pretty serious offence uh, in, in commercial terms uh, as well. So we would expect people to be uh, banned because they've signed the license on the software. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think e-doping is an issue and if anything, it's probably, I mean, it's definitely more prevalent than, than doping is generally in e-sports, not, not to underestimate the scale of that problem. I mean, if, if you've played Counter-Strike, you've almost certainly played against someone who's been using a, a, an aimbot or a wall hack or something like that. That happens mm -hmm. almost at all levels of it to some extent. Um, perhaps not it's a lot more difficult to get away with if you're doing it at the very top level. And I think ESIC has had involvement in at least a couple of cases, um, one of which Michelle just referenced, uh, where they've caught players using uh, software cheats and things like that. It's it, it's absolutely a problem, um, and I it, it's something that someone needs to do something about. Um, publishers can be quite hands off with that kind of thing, or when they do come in, they're very very heavy handed. Uh, and I, I think it's 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 finding a balance and working out um, you know particularly when something is very very prevalent as a problem, how you deal with that in a way that's proportionate to uh, you know, the behavior in question and how concerned people are about it. Um, it's, it. It's treading that line that you're preserving the integrity of the sport without handing people lifelong bans for doing something that lots and lots of people are doing. Yeah, and we should, and we should not, uh, not uh, forget about the, the sanctions that the uh, organizers or the events uh, place on the uh, on the uh, esports uh, cheaters, so they are they are fined, they are uh, they are deprived um, uh, from from their results, maybe deprived from their results in the competitions, and also so uh, there is as Nick said uh, uh, and Michelle, there is a line of a potential dispute between the IP holder uh, because of the breach of the licensing agreement. So it's it's um, it, it 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 causes the consequences that uh, the cheaters may face both on the contractual level and disciplinary level. Yeah, and, and something you mentioned earlier, Alexander. Um, you know, I, I'm sure it's it. it it's an existential threat to esports for a number of reasons, um, but it, it's absolutely something I think that sponsors who are non-endemic brands all piling into the esports space are going to be concerned about. And um, you know, it's definitely something that might trigger a morality clause within a sponsorship agreement if they find a player's been using a, an aimbot or whatever to win their games. It's it, it's exactly the kind of thing which um, you know money within those organisations is going to care about. So I think we we might see a bit of a more of an impetus to do things about it because of that in any event. But the, the danger, of course, at the moment is that um, a, as an industry, esports um, hasn't been able to, uh, to to sort of stop the culture of being able to buy hacks and cheats in, in, in the sort of just in standard you know, sort of ordinary games. I, I know my own son uh, was delighted to see his uh, Grand Theft Auto cheat book uh, on you know, sort of, uh, and I'm, what on earth have you got this for? Uh, because obviously it's not a game I play, and I'm like, hey, oh yeah, I need this, I need this. And if you have a culture that's like that, we're in danger of actually skewing the the, the integrity from the start, and and so we have to start from somewhere. And if we're going to 
encourage the publishers themselves to act in a draconian way, I think we send a very strong message. So I'd actually encourage that strong action in order to dissuade people that this is really where they should be, where they should be honing their skills in esports. Thank you. Um, maybe we can then turn to questions uh, of the participants. I saw some in the chat. Uh, Anton, do you want to ask your question again, not in the chat? May I invite you? Mm, yeah, that's possible, probably. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I have, I have uh, maybe sorry for, for, for quite particular, but uh, I'm just curious about some practical uh, uh, aspects of, 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 of doping control uh, conduct, conducted by ISIC. Uh, and uh, my questions were more about like uh, uh, who, who is conducting this uh, doping procedure. Do we have uh, some staff of DCO? So do you have uh, some third party? testing agencies uh, and uh, where these tests are analyzed. Uh, it's in, in VADA accredited laboratories or uh, just other laboratories and uh, uh, whether some standards uh, for testing and investigations uh, are in place. And um, especially about this uh, last uh, question is um, more with the concern that um, for, for, for world anti-doping uh, world uh, that, that the idea of, of strict liability uh, that a person is, is strictly liable for what is uh, in his or her uh, body uh, is uh, counterbalanced by uh, these um, rights that athletes have especially uh, like having a B sample uh, opening and I mean this procedure in, in, in place and I'm, I'm just curious whether ASIC uh, adopted the same approach the same standards or uh, it's it's something else. Uh, I thank you in advance. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, <clears throat> Anton. And I'm not sure if you're in the anti-doping world uh, uh, usually, but um, yes, it, the the whole program is based on uh, those procedural standards. We do have doping control officers. They are trained by uh, they are trained doping control officers that have then had an additional training um, from ESIC to conduct uh, the uh, tests. Uh, we don't use WADA accredited laboratories. We use um, laboratories that are um, ISO certified for the same. Uh, um, uh, what's it called? Um, HPLC, I think it is uh, analysis, so uh, high pressure liquid chromatography analysis that would be undertaken at a WADA accredited laboratory. To be honest, our program's too small probably for the WADA accredited laboratories uh, in order to get a reasonable uh, cost. Um, so uh, exactly the same uh, standards from the point of view of chain of custody. And as the ESIC procedures allow, yes, of course, there are um, standards of investigation there um, that can bring in uh, external uh, qualified investigators and um, obviously th the disciplinary hearing would go through the ESIC um, independent tribunal and independent appeals panel. So yes, very much based on the WADA standards. Thank you. <clears throat> I think there was one last question and then we're already a bit over time. Um, the question was from Han Cheng Bei. Uh, regarding the gray area of cheating, uh, something like lowering resolution, increasing contrast, things of that sort. How does uh, ESA handle things like this, which are doable in game, but possibly uh, considered an exploit? Ooh, um... I mean, in my view, that's, that's something that's normally dealt with within the rules of the competition organizer. So the parameters in which your game has to be set up in order to allow a quality of competition across participants. Yeah. Um, it's, I would say, probably a bit, bit of an onerous burden to put on ESIC to do that, because then they would have to, for every single game that's potentially played, uh, you know, have you know, a long list of exactly what, what, what's fair and what's not. Um, but it's very common when you, in tournament rules, to, to see, um, you know, this is the resolution your screen must be set at. Um, this must happen in this way. Uh, and I, I think that's probably the right place um, to put that burden rather than on an organization like ESIC. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think that concludes our webinar on esports. Um, probably we should have held it in TeamSpeak. Um, <laughs> or Discord. Discord, yeah. I was going to say Discord. Uh, but I think it worked quite well. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, I might give also a last word to Rodolf, uh, who co-organized this event together with Alexander, um, to have a last thank you to everyone. Thanks, thanks very much for having us. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Michelle. And, and thanks, uh, uh, Alexandra and, and uh, yes, Leo, again, for uh, putting together that event. We hope it has been uh, as uh, informative and exciting it has been uh, for us, uh, for me at least. Um, please note that uh, most likely um, we will broadcast um, that event on YouTube and, and Twitch. We're still looking into the details of this, but in case you have missed uh, part of it or you know about people who wanted to join but could not make it, well, they, they will probably have another chance at uh, having a peek and listening in. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, we hope to see you soon in another event. Thanks.